So I'd like to thank MADAD and the McGovern organizers for the um, invitation to participate today. Um, it is a privilege, and if I'm honest, also somewhat of a surprise to find myself promoted, albeit to a, for a day, to the lofty world of neural models. Um, nevertheless, I shall try and uh, join this throng. So what we've been interested in for some time now are the systems and circuits that enable animals to act on demand, to extract information from the sensory world that surrounds them, to store it if necessary, and to transform that for the purpose of um, behavior through movement. And as this slide from a little scribble from Giacomo Balla, the Italian futurist, um, indicates, um, in mammals, some of the most sophisticated motor behaviors that the neural systems have to accommodate are to do with the movement of limbs from seem to be metastable. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for this. Great. So what Bala is describing here in locomotion is the avoidance of obstacles and in reaching is object manipulation. And somehow the circuits that control movement have to accommodate these diverse um, motor tasks. And one way of you know, conceiving of this that many people have suggested is to place it in some sort of sensory recipient world. So the idea would be that a motor plan sends a series of commands which result in motor output. Eventually there is the validation of that motor command through sensory feedback in a recipient system which updates the motor plan. And it's been commented by many people that this simple reflex sensory circuitry is burdened with many constraints and challenges, some of which are demonstrated or shown here. So this comes from the world of um, primate and human motor control where individuals are moving, particularly through arm movements, looking at the variability. And so some of these um, constraints are demonstrated here in the form of the variability of sensory input. Proprioceptive sensory neurons are subject to massive changes in firing rate, and somehow the central nervous system has to accommodate that. The transformation of motor output to sensory feedback is associated with delays that will tend to destabilize output systems. And then finally, one has to accommodate the idea that during a single motor act, the strategies needed to accommodate biomechanical constraints and fatigue and other things have to change rather dramatically over time. And the approach that we have been taking is simply to ask whether probing the underlying organization of neural circuits that are thought to um, control these different motor mechanisms might provide any insight into um, the um, constraints, challenges, and principles of motor control. And so in work that I'm not going to talk about, the variability of sensory input has been demonstrated to be subject to a, an inhibitory constraint exerted directly on the presynaptic sensory neurons. I'm going to spend a little time talking about 
um, circuits for delay, that accommodate delays and that are involved in changes in motor strategy over time. So let's begin with the delay problem um, here. And so many people have argued that there are one of the solutions to the delay in sensory feedback, the delays incurred by muscle contraction, for example, but also felt throughout the sensory recipient side of things, can be overcome by introducing an internal copy of the motor command that feeds in, in many cases, to systems that are involved in predicting, as you heard a little bit from Nate, the sensory consequences of predicted motor acts. Um, and so the challenge here is to try and find aspects of circuitry that relate to these imputed um, internal copy pathways. And so there are many designs of these internal copies that you can imagine. I want to focus on just one of them here, which is where instead of providing parallel inputs to a recipient system and to the motor output, in this case, a single neuron assumes both um, features of providing a pre-motor output as well as relaying some other internal input into um, um, the recipient pathway in the form of a single neuron that is branched with one descending and one ascending act axon. And the reason for thinking that this sort of circuit might have relevance has come from work that was originated by Anders Lundberg and has been continued by Brohr Alstenmark in the context of proprio-spinal neurons in the spinal cord. And so what Alstenmark and Lundberg first described is that at cervical levels of the spinal cord, they're so-called proprio-spinal neurons, one branch of which projects onto motor neurons and contributes to the process of motor excitation, a second branch which will project to the lateral reticular nucleus, a relay station en route to the cerebellum. And since things like forward models are often inferred to exist within cerebellar structures, this raised the possibility that proprio-spinal neurons might have something to do with this internal copy of motor control. And there is some evidence in cats and primates that that might be true from these sorts of classical experiments carried out by Brohr Alstermark, where one lesions the premotor branch of a proprio-spinal neuron and then show that, in this case in cats, that animals have reaching defects. They overshoot, they undershoot, and the normal fidelity of a reaching grass for a food pellet is seriously degraded there. But this is really tantamount to saying that we've lost a premotor input and it doesn't really interrogate the internal copy component of that bifurcating neuron. And so with this background, Ayman Azim, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, has teamed up with Brohr Alstermark to try to see whether we can gain access into this general set of problems in mice by first of all trying to delineate genetically this set of proprio-spinal neurons and then manipulate them in various ways and test their involvement, particularly focusing on this internal branch that provides input to the lateral reticular nucleus. And so the features of proprio-spinal neurons described in the cat has them predominantly forming an ipsilateral projection and then projecting as a last order excitatory input to motor neurons via the release of glutamate. And if one compares those two features with the known subtypes of interneurons that we've been defining in the spinal cord on the basis of projection pattern and transmitter phenotype, there's only one class that correspond to this group, and they're the so-called V2A interneurons, which can be defined molecularly by expression of the transcription factor CHEX10. So this permitted Ayman to try a set of experiments to ask whether the V2A neurons have the anatomical features of the proprio-spinal neurons de described in cat and in monkey. And so we made a CHEX10 transgenic mouse expressing Cre recombinase, and then in that background, if we inject an adeno-associated virus expressing a floxed fluorescent protein, derivative there. 
and ask whether the neurons that project to motor neurons also project to the lateral reticular nucleus. You can see a very dense terminal YFP expression in the lateral reticular nucleus. But this could still mean that some neurons project to LRN, some to motor neurons, and they're not one and the same. And so Iman did a further experiment where he crossed in um, a YFP reporter there so that we can identify individual YFP positive V2A neurons and then asked if they have an individual neuron has a projection to the LRN by doing stereotactic injection of CTB and getting retrograde tracing and also by injecting wheat germaglutinin into individual forelimb muscles so that it's transported retrogradely transsynaptically and then it labels the same neuron. And so in this way, you can build up the fact that individual V2A neurons project both to motor neurons and to the lateral reticular nucleus. And we estimate, and it's probably an underestimate, that somewhere around 30 to 40% of these neurons comprise these anatomical features. So with this and the ability to express channel rhodopsin in these neurons through this genetic entry point, we can now ask whether activation of PN neurons is sufficient to drive lateral reticular neurons, an essence, an essential component of trying to test the function of these neurons in some internal copy pathway. And so the way that um, Iman did this is to express channel rhodopsin in these neurons in the same transgenic background and then insert a small light probe into the lateral reticular nucleus so that we can activate the terminals of these neurons by selective photostimulation at appropriate wavelength, record from LRN neurons, identify those LRN neurons as projecting to the cerebellum by antidromic spike activation there, turn the light on at this wavelength and see in LRN neurons the synaptic consequence of activation these PN terminals, and we know the identity of these neurons because there is a spike collision here after cerebellar stimulation. So this says that activating PN terminals is sufficient to drive LRN activity, a first prerequisite. But in these studies, we, I'm an, and Braw spent a long time trying to establish that activation of the terminal doesn't lead to the propagation of an antidromic spike that then passes the cell body and would then activate the premotor input. And so the idea here is to record this time from PN neurons. We can activate the PN neurons with direct electrical stimulation of the lateral reticular nucleus and PN terminals, but turning the light on never, ever, ever gave us any response in these neurons. So for reasons that remain um, convenient but still obscure, activating terminals produces a one-way transmission where we activate the LRN system and don't produce a direct premotor activation. So then the ability to selectively activate this, pre, this internal copy arm suggested what behavioral experiments could we do to try and test the impact of selective internal copy activation. And influenced by experiments in cat and monkey, Iman developed a reaching assay, a goal-directed reaching assay in mice, in which um, mice are placed separated from a food pellet by a perspex barrier and then asked to reach through that barrier and then with high-speed um, video cameras we determined the kinematic trajectory and velocity of these reaches. I'll just show you that again um, since it went off. So here is a mouse with a reflective pellet marker on the paw reaching for this target and you can see here a relative linear trajectory and we can monitor the velocity and several other parameters of this feature. And so then what happens um, under these conditions if we inactivate or we activate the PN system. We've done both inactivation of V2A neurons and shown reaching defects using this assay. And what happens if we selectively activate this internal copy branch? And so here we're doing this um, before um, turning the um, PN terminal activation system on and then looking afterwards, which is plotted here, 
what you can see is activation selectively of this internal copy branch produces a severe discoordination in the normal linearity of reach trajectory and in the velocity. And every time you stimulate, you see um, the same defect in trajectory there. So in some way here, activation of this internal copy branch has led to motor defects. Inactivation of V2A neurons as a population um, leads to reaching defects, supporting the idea that in some way this system um, is um, involved in motor control. And so we, Iman has been now interested in how activation of PN terminals activating LRN neurons then leads to this um, perturbation of motor behavior. And so the idea that um, he's been examining is that activation of this system by recruiting LRN neurons, which project to the cerebellum, produces a relatively direct feedback control that can be sensed by recording from motor neurons following PN terminal activation. So what happens when you turn the light on while recording from motor neurons? And what you find is that there's a relatively short latency response recorded in motor neurons following PN terminal activation in LRN. So about three to four milliseconds after the onset of activation here, we see motor neuron responses. So that is a quick response there, which we imagine um, is not mediated by cerebellar cortex directly, but may involve the activation of deep cerebellar nuclei that would then activate the reticular spinal system and come back and project down to the spinal cord. So this response system here is sufficiently rapid to explain the defects in trajectory on the duration of the reach that we can monitor with kinematics here. And we have some evidence that this really does reflect the output of the LRN to the cerebellum because if we now lesion the LRN cerebellar output system, the amplitude of these motor responses, this time recorded as field potential, is decreased to the order of about 70%. So this supports the idea that the LRN projections to the cerebellum initiates a rapid motor response, which then is exerted in terms of um, both physiology and perturbations in behavior. So in this system, what I think has emerged is that the proprio-spinal neurons in mouse provide, are capable of providing a direct motor command through their premotor input there, but also serve to activate this LRN sensory receiving system on the way to the cerebellum, and then can, in a sense, in one neuron, link output and sensory input. Now, there are many issues that we don't understand in analysis of this system. One is that presumably this is an excitatory neuron that activates the motor neuron, and yet the consequences of activating the internal copy are to reinforce that activation where you might expect perhaps to see the opposite negative cancellation sign based on the things that Nate has been telling you. And so um, the basis of this reinforcing loop may reflect the fact that, in fact, there's not just single, one single population of PN neurons. Sylvia Arbor's lab has provided evidence for many different PN populations, some excitatory, some inhibitory, and we don't understand the activation of those neurons in any detail. And it may be that there are degrees of muscle specificity. That is, that when you activate in real circuitry, you're activating highly specific subsets of this generic circuit that we've engaged. And so what Iman is doing at the moment is trying to, first of all, test the endogenous conditions physiologically for recruitment of these neurons by expressing various genetically encoded calcium indicators and monitoring in the LRN the conditions in motor actions that are sufficient to recruit PNs, which is an essential first step. And then to try various methods, ideally not just for activating this arm, but for inactivating the arm, and looking at the consequences in terms of adaptive features of motor control. So this is one example of a genetically defined circuit that can then begin to be hopefully picked apart in some further detail. 
for the last part of this talk, what I'd like to do is switch to the second issue that we've been trying to understand in terms of um, underlying circuitry. And that is this idea that motor acts are shaped to meet the tasks at hand. You have a fixed set of motor neurons, a fixed set of muscles, and you're born with that, and somehow you have to negotiate the vast repertoire of motor possibilities that exist in the world around you. So the idea in this system here is to look at the way in which strategies for motor activation change over time. So the idea would be that the um, appropriate motor acts early in a motor plan would be different from those late, and how can we understand that at the level of circuitry? And in order to introduce this problem, I want to go back 100 years to the Sherringtonian view of limb motor coordination, and that is this idea of at limb joints of flexion and extension as opponent antagonistic alternating systems. So for example, when you are flexing, you activate forelimb muscles, which are different from those muscles that are activating an extension. And Sherrington had the foresight to come up with one feature of the circuitry that drives this capacity for limb alternation. And that is the sensory afferent feedback that is, for example, providing excitatory input to a flexor motor neuron is at the same time ensuring the quiescence of the extensor motor neuron by recruiting an intervening inhibitory interneuron. So this reciprocal inhibitory interneuron is at the core of the alternation program. And then in the passage of time, there have to be ways of inactivating this inhibitory neuron. We know that one of those neurons is the Renshaw interneuron found in the ventral spinal cord that in part has a motor collateral recruitment system. So this is the classical view promoted by Sherrington of alternation. But we also know that there are certain motor acts and sensory feedback systems, both reflexive and voluntary, that favor a different view of co-activation or co-contraction. In fact, the first people who ever sort of articulated this alternative view were a neurologist and a physiologist at Columbia, so I felt compelled to follow their lead some 90 years ago. And so one of the motor acts that favors co-activation is the act of balancing on a narrow beam or the act of maintaining your ankle at a um, tight physical fidelity. So um, in work by Arthur Prohashka, as individuals are asked to balance on tight ropes or narrow beams, and you record physiologically, you see a much greater extent of co-activation. Similarly, Jens Bo Nielsen's group in Denmark recorded um, muscle activities from ballerinas in the Danish Royal Ballet, and here at the ankle, you get co-activation of flexors and extensors for dramatic periods of time. So the issue is, how can you understand the circuitry that can modulate these transitions from alternation to co-activation? Presumably, they're internal systems that are directing that at will in the central nervous system. So Andrew Murray in the lab has tried to emulate the idea that acts that involve balance and the vestibular system may be involved in um, triggering, and we can measure these changes in motor strategy. And so what Andy has been doing is training mice to walk on a narrow balance beam and then inducing a vestibular activating perturbation by deflecting the beam, at the same time monitoring the position of the animal on the balance beam and also doing EMG recordings to look at the nature of transitions. So I'll just show you the basic assay system. The mouse is walking along. There's a small perturbation laterally and the mouse does a pretty good job of maintaining its posture. So here in this tail reflector, we're seeing that it manages to maintain its position on that balance beam despite the perturbation that activates the vestibular system. And when you record from EMG studies of individual antagonist muscles at different joints in the limb, you see something interesting too. That so these are extensors, these are flexor muscles here. So here, early on, after the perturbation, 
you see extensor activity in all three joints and no evidence for flexor activity, and that is charted here quantitatively. But then some 10 or 20 milliseconds later, you see a period of coactivation, both of flexors and extensors. So this vestibular stimulus, much as in humans, is producing an initial asymmetric extensor-specific activation followed by a coactivation phase. Now, this, of course, doesn't prove that the vestibular system is in any way involved. It could be the response of proprioceptors in the limb that are achieving this. So Andy designed a set of experiments to lesion that part of the vestibular system that is projecting to the hind limb, the lateral vestibular nucleus, in the mouse and see if it had any impact as a first experiment. So the way that he did that is to use an adeno-associated virus diphtheria toxin receptor stereotactic injection, then sometime later to inject diphtheria toxin selectively in the lumbar spinal cord so that it's only taken up by the axons of LVN neurons that project to the lumbar spinal cord, and then after diphtheria toxin exposure, monitor the number of neurons in the LVN by a fluorogold injection sometime later. And the basic upshot of this is that these stereotactic injections combined with lumbar diphtheria toxin administration produce a 75 to 80 percent deletion of LVN neurons in a selective way. The medial vestibular nucleus is not affected under these conditions. So does this have any impact in terms of um, motor control systems? So here is a mouse now after a lesion. And you can see, I hope, that it has a much harder job clinging onto that balance beam, and that is quantified here. So we see some sign of um, you know, a motor behavioral impairment under LVN ablation, rather as in humans. And if you look at the EMG, what you see, and I'm just showing you one um, a knee joint system here, that the amplitude of the early extensor-specific responses severely decreased, and there's also a corresponding loss in the late coactivation. <laughs> so the vestibular nucleus is involved in this process. And in a sense, it argues that there are three phases of um, transition in motor response, an early extensor-specific activation, something that we call a priming step, where something has to change in order to permit coactivation and a late coactivation step. And in some ways, this is similar to um, views based on human motor control. For example, Steve Scott's um, emphasis on um, optimal feedback control, not optical feedback control here, where you get um, short latency reflexive responses and then longer latency responses, which can be separated by the nature of the input stimulus. Um, so we've been interested in trying to understand the underlying elements of spinal circuitry that underlie this transition from alternation to coactivation. First, dealing with the early basis of extensor-specific activation. And so what Andy did is to use an anatomical labeling technique in which we introduce a rabies virus which can be retrogradely transported into the presynaptic terminals transynaptically into either extensor or flexor muscles and simply measure the number of neurons in the LVN. And what you find is the only time you see labeled lateral um, um, LVN neurons is when you inject into extensor muscles and never into flexor muscles here. So the basis of extensor specificity seems to be that the LVN neurons selectively innovate extensor motor neurons accounting for this early activation. And this agrees with older physiological studies that Sten Grilner and Toshinora Hongo performed in the cat. So this explains the basis of the early response, the asymmetric response. So the most interesting step, in my view, is this next priming response, the middle time period, where you have to arguably overcome the impact of the dominance of this reciprocal inhibitory interneuronal synapse. So how could that be achieved? It's been known, and as I mentioned, that Renshaw neurons provide one input to reciprocal inhibitory neurons, 
and Andy Murray has shown using anatomy that about half the Renshaw neurons themselves receive a direct input from the lateral um, vestibular nucleus. So this provides a rapid anatomical substrate for activation of LBN neurons to activate Renshaw to inhibit, which would then presumably um, lead to the po possibility of coactivation. So these are anatomical studies that have led to circuit wiring diagrams. How can we test the impact of any of these systems functionally in terms of motor control? And so we can try and drive this core circuitry towards um, alternation. In certain manipulations, I'm going to concentrate on the drive to coactivation. So you would predict that if we inhibited or inactivated this 1A reciprocal inhibitory interneuron, it would then um, reduce alternation and increase the drive to coactivation. And we're trying to do that with markers for interneuron subtypes. What we could also conceive is that we could fool the system into switching the sign of this interneuron from inhibition to excitation, producing a constitutive reciprocal excitation. And we've managed to do that and examine the consequences in terms of um, limb motor coordination. So this is really testing, in a sense, the Sherringtonian view of the dominance of reciprocal inhibition in this system. And the way that we've done that, and this is the work of David Ng, is to make use of the fact that this is a glycinergic with a little bit of GABA thrown in inhibitory transmitter system mm -hmm. that the chloride equilibrium potential then determines the response of cells to activation of these glycine or GABA receptors. Under normal conditions, by virtue of the KCC2 extrusion pump, Intracellular chloride is low, so you activate the receptor, you come in, a chloride rushes in, and you get an IPSP. If we inactivated this chloride um, extrusion pump there, then chloride is found at high concentrations in the cell, you activate the same receptor, now chloride rushes out, and you don't depolarize the system. So David used that logic to inactivate KCC2 selectively in motor neurons, and then ask the consequences in terms of limb motor control. And so I'm going to show you two images or two movies now. One of a young mouse in which KCC2 has been inactivated selectively in motor neurons. And you can see the limbs are extended there. The mouse is not paralyzed, but its limbs are hyperactivated in an extended mode consistent with the idea of coactivation. And this phenotype gets worse with time, so if we look at, at an older mouse here, you can see that the mouse is relatively immobile, and it's immobile, and it's resting on its tiptoes there, so every joint is activated maximally under these conditions, and it simply cannot move either left-right coordination or at individual joints. And if we record the EMG from knee antagonists at those conditions, we see a dramatic evidence for co-activation of joints that normally are operating. So this, I think, supports the idea that um, this reciprocal inhibitory synapse is dominant and is important in determining the degree of alternation co-activation equilibrium. And we're now trying to examine in other ways um, how this system really controls that um, transition between alternation and coactivation. And so what we're trying to do now in the future, because we have, and I haven't gone through this, markers for many different subtypes of interneurons, Renshaw cells, other small subpopulations, in principle, we can inactivate the Renshaw cell, see if that drives you towards um, the alternation mode, inactivate eventually the 1A inhibitory neuron, see if it drives you in the opposite direction on that continuum there, and hopefully build up a greater degree of confidence in the circuit diagrams that are mediating these different vestibular descending inputs. The other thing that 
is strongly implied by these results is a heterogeneity of LVN neurons themselves. The simplest way of thinking about this is that the early response involves a set of LVN neurons that activate elements of a spinal motor circuitry that are different from those that are needed to suppress the renshaw cells or to activate the reticular spinal system that we think has got a lot to do with this late phase of coactivation. So if we could find molecular correlates of these three populations, we would then be able to predict the motor consequences of activation of these three different populations, and we're trying to um, do that extensively at the moment. So I just want to finish with this idea that we can take a systems level plan of um, motor <coughs> output and its sensory feedback and slowly pick apart different elements of that system at the synaptic and neuronal level. The presynaptic gating that I didn't talk about, this internal copy system that Iman has been studying, and then this switching strategy for alternation and co-activation that is so important in controlling many aspects of motor behavior. So I will stop there, just highlight the people who've done the work. Um, Iman really led the uh, Proprospinal Neuron Project. Iman's here in the audience, so I would encourage you to find him and pester him about more details of that. Andrew Murray has been leading the vestibular alternation co-activation project. David Ng has been trying to manipulate chloride currents. And we've been getting a lot of advice in this system from Jens Bo Nielsen, a human <coughs> physiologist in Denmark, who in a remarkable way predicted many of the involvements of uh, Renshaw cells and 1A interneurons on the basis of human studies. And I still don't quite know how he managed to do that. But everything we are doing is really a reflection and testing of these human physiological studies. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.